Today on Applied Science, I'd like to show you these silver nanoprisms. Each of the colorful liquids you can see there contain silver nanoparticles, and the shape of those particles are like little antennae that catch certain wavelengths of light. This is a lot like the blue morpho butterfly wing, which actually isn't made out of a blue material. It's just shaped in a way that reflects blue light. But the really crazy bit is how we make the different colors. We start with basically blob-shaped silver nanoparticles and shine intense light from an LED on them, which causes the blobs to grow into these very flat triangular nanoprisms. And the color of the light that we shine on there determines how big the triangle grows, controlling the edge length, which then controls the color of the solution because we're changing the size of the antenna. Pretty crazy, right? I actually came across this idea from watching YouTube and I always test out these ideas on friends and coworkers. And when I get like strange looks, I know I've got a, a good topic for a video. So in today's video, I'm going to show you how to make these. It doesn't require any special equipment to make the nanoprisms. Uh, and then we'll kick it up a notch and I'll show you how I concentrated them in a centrifuge and looked at them under the electron microscope. And then we'll do some spectroscopy measurements too. I first saw this idea on the CMD ITR YouTube channel which posts interesting materials research from universities all over and present in a really interesting way. Unfortunately, they haven't posted in about nine years, but it's still fun and nostalgic to watch old YouTube videos. And so the recipe that I'm gonna show you is based on the one that was presented in that CMD video. So you wanna start by mixing up all these stock solutions. And um, I'm not gonna go over exactly everyone, but I put a column of mass here if you wanna mix up a 20 ml stock solution at this molarity. A um, couple things to watch out for. In general, when someone specifies a solution and gives you a millimolar um, you know, concentration that it needs to be mixed to, be careful if the, if the ingredient you're using is hydrated or not. Something that always comes up, if you say, I want a 30 millimolar sodium citrate solution, well, sodium citrate, if you buy it, you know, like this, it's the dihydrate form, right? So that changes the molar mass because it's got two water molecules stuck in there. And a lot of times it's unclear if the person is talking about the anhydrous form or the hydrated form or which hydrated form. So just keep in mind, there's one little thing to watch out for. Um, most of these stock solutions are pretty stable, except the sodium borohydride. That one doesn't last long at all. And so if you're gonna mix this up, mix the sodium borohydride minutes before you want to use it. And if you're not gonna use it for another few minutes, just throw it away and make a fresh one again. Um, in the video uh, previously, it was just shown to keep all these stock solutions on ice. I didn't do that. The only one that's really sensitive is the borohydride. And like I say, it, it has such a short lifetime anyway. Just throw it away and mix up a fresh one. You're using such tiny quantities of the ingredient. It, it almost doesn't matter. There's a slight typo in the CMD video. Uh, they specify to use 10 times too much silver nitrate. So instead of using two milliliters of the 50 millimolar solution, you actually wanna use 200 microliters. That's definitely what they were intending to. And so this one, this one actually stopped me for a while. I would mix up a solution and it would turn almost completely black, like very dark brown. And I was thinking, oh, I must be screwing something up. And as you'll see in the video, uh, excluding oxygen, like getting all the oxygen out of the solution is a big factor. And I thought, I must be messing that up. I you know, tried stirring it more, I tried gassing it more, I tried vacuuming it, and I still ended up with this very dark, not good looking product here. And then I figured out I was using 10 times too much silver. So just uh, use, use the right amount. And so the amounts that ended up working for me in a 250 ml flask, 95 mls of water, 200 microliters of the sodium, uh, or the, the um, that should say silver nitrate solution, uh, one ml of the sodium citrate solution, and you degas this. Now in the video, there was a lot of emphasis put on bubbling nitrogen for like an hour. And if you don't do it for an hour, it's not gonna work. If you bubble it for half an hour, it's not gonna work. I, I found that it actually is fine. My method is to use a vacuum pump and put a vacuum on it for about three or four minutes. That'll get most of the oxygen out of the solution. And then I bubbled argon in there for another three minutes. So the whole thing was definitely five minutes and I didn't have any problem. If you don't have bottled gas, argon or nitrogen, I have a feeling it would still work just fine with a vacuum pump. Just vacuum it for a while and that will get most of the uh, oxygen out. And then um, 
I added the sodium borohydride, freshly made sodium borohydride solution, all in one. So in the CMD video, it was kind of like put in in one burst and then they waited a while and put in another little bit and another little bit. I didn't do any of that. I just shot it in all at once and it seemed fine. Another thing to make your life easier, uh, the video specified the use of BSPP, which is like a, I guess, a polymer type thing that helps the nanoparticles not stick together. BSPP is fairly difficult to find, so instead you can use PVP, which is polyvinyl perolidone, and that one is uh, easy enough. You can get that on Amazon, I think. Another interesting thing is, you know, all these scientific papers try to be scientific and everything by specifying quantities in millimolar and molarity. But when it comes to a weird polymer like this that has huge molecules, it doesn't actually make sense to talk about the molar concentration because the, the molecules are so big and the range of sizes is so big. So I, the, the final thing that I ended up using was 50 milligrams of PVP for this 100 ml batch of nanoparticles. I also experimented with adding the PVP early or after, like before the nanoparticles were created or a little bit after, and it didn't seem to make much difference. And then finally, you want to adjust the pH. And this should be done fairly accurately. If you have a, a digital pH meter like this, um, use that. These are actually not too expensive. Or you could probably just use pH paper or something like, like this would probably be okay too. And you're shooting for pH 11, which for me turned out to be 2 ml of the 50 millimolar sodium hydroxide solution. The original video also specified that you should keep this thing on ice and you should age it and everything. And I, I didn't really do that too carefully. One, I didn't keep any of this stuff on ice, although it was fairly cool in the garage that day. So, you know, it wasn't at an abnormally high room temperature. Let's talk briefly about what's going on here. The silver is in solution, it's silver nitrate. And what we're gonna do is add a reducing agent to it, which is this sodium borohydride. And that's going to reduce the silver nitrate into silver metal. And so if we just did that alone, let's just try it right now. If we mix this up, you can see that it forms a solution there. And if we didn't do anything else to it, these silver particles that we just created will stick together and eventually it'll just settle to the bottom. It'll make a, a precipitate and that's, that's not nanoparticles, that's just silver gunk. And so by adding the sodium citrate, the citrate molecules will coat the nanoparticles and keep them from sticking together. So we actually end up with what we want, which are these separate nanoparticles, not a big sticky mass of silver metal. And then finally, the PVP is also just to keep things from sticking together. I'm a little unclear. I think it's maybe like a time scale thing. Like the citrate works immediately and keeps the nanoparticles separate as they're being formed in solution. And then the PVP or the BSPP acts as like a, a colloiding agent just to keep the, the solution stable for a long period of time. And that's important because we need this thing to stay stable enough where we can shine the intense UV or the LED light on it and grow these things to the size we want. The stock solution of nanoparticles is a very pale yellow color and its peak absorption is right around 400 nanometers. Uh, that's just based on the size of the particles and they're, I think, blob shaped, roughly spherical. So anyway, so what we wanna do is pour that stock solution or those fresh nanoparticles into little jars and then irradiate them with an intense LED. So I looked around for sources of intense LED light, hoping to find some kind of multi-spectral LED source, and I couldn't find anything. So I ended up building my own, and all of this is on GitHub, it's open source and everything. And you can actually get all of these parts at the moment, which is a benefit. Um, I decided to you know, make this general purpose in case I wanna use it in a different project. So it goes all the way from 280 nanometer up to 940 nanometer in 15 steps or something like that. And it's got, uh, you know, couple of switches here so you can adjust the intensity and the wavelength you want. And it's quite bright. Each LED is about uh, a watt, I think. And you can kind of see there. And then, uh, you know, throw a microcontroller on there because why not? And so then you can actually, <laughs> let me shut the camera down so you can actually see this. Yeah, it's nice and pretty and quite useful too for experiments where you need um, very accurate wavelength control or you want to switch back and forth quickly. Now remember, if you're thinking of using RGB LEDs, keep in mind those only have three wavelengths to choose from in there. Mixing the colors doesn't work. We actually need a specific wavelength to grow these nanoprisms into the shape we want. 
And so mixing you know, red and green light together is not the same thing as just using a yellow LED. So the whole purpose of going through the trouble of building this little LED multispectral device is just to get uh, different, different actual LEDs that emit that wavelength. Color mixing doesn't really work for our purpose here. The time it takes to grow these nanoprisms varies based on how big the target size is. And that kind of makes sense, right? We're starting with maybe five or 10 nanometer diameter blobs. And to grow that into a 50 nanometer triangle, you know, kind of makes sense that that would take less time than growing it into a 100 nanometer triangle, just because the, you know, the time it takes to rearrange the silver molecules or atoms is, is less. So it, it ends up being, uh, the range is from a few hours for a very short change in wavelength absorption up to several days actually for a long one. So the longest one, the longest side length prisms that I made were with 617 nanometer light and that took several days to fully transform. So an area for future study would be to vary the intensity of the light and measure how long it takes to make this transformation from blobs to prisms. And I have a feeling the function is gonna be interesting. There's probably like a threshold value where below that value, you don't get the transition at all. But then it probably has an asymptotic thing where there really is a time component that you can't make faster because it's depending on these chemical processes to happen. So I, I found this out, or I, I suspect this, because I took a laser and shined it through the solution, thinking that the laser light would be so intense that it would cause this prism growth way faster than the LED. And if we looked at it in time lapse, we would be able to see the the other color solution sort of falling down out of the laser line. Like you could actually see the, the transformation happening, at least in time scales that would be okay with, you know, with some time lapse. But it ended up not working at all, actually. So I, was, I didn't leave it long enough to see if the laser would eventually cause the whole solution to change color. But I definitely did not see any inhomogeneity or any sort of like falling of dark, you know, colored liquid out of the laser line, which is kind of what I was thinking. So I, I, I'm feeling like there's a time component that you can't get rid of just by putting more and more intense light into it, but that would be an additional thing to study. So what's actually going on in here? Um, we know that these nanoparticles are being held apart by the chemistry we put together in the first part of this experiment. Otherwise, they would just naturally want to agglomerate together um, because it's chemically advantageous. There's sort of an energy gradient that's causing these things to want to stick together anyway. That's one fact. Another fact is that the solution of fresh nanoparticles does absorb a little bit of light at all kinds of different wavelengths. Even though the peak is at 405 or 400 nanometers, it does actually have the ability to absorb light at other wavelengths, just because the particles are randomly sized and some are bigger than others and that sort of thing. That's the second fact. And so putting those things together, uh, we can see how this might work. Like if we put in energy at a specific wavelength, those particles that just happen to be shaped in a way that attracts more energy will now have a chemical advantage over their, <laughs> over their friends that are smaller or bigger. So by sort of giving it an energy at a specific wavelength, we're giving a sort of a chemical advantage to the particles that are naturally shaped to absorb that wavelength of light. And this process basically goes on and on by doing this, more and more silver is basically transferred to those particles that are having this energy advantage by being given energy from outside the system. And since we're giving it this energy at only one wavelength, it's all, we're sort of selecting for a specific size particle. And as it turns out, they're able to exchange silver atoms with each other. Uh, and as long as you're giving it this, at this wavelength, you're basically preferring a certain size. And given enough time, you can convert the size of the entire batch of stuff just by giving it this colored light. <laughs> it's kind of a cool process. It kind of makes sense. Um, but from the way that I described it, you would think that the process should be reversible. So if we transform the yellow, pale yellow solution into dark purple, for example, by giving it a specific wavelength of light, why can't we shine 405 nanometer light on it and bring it back? I actually hadn't seen this mentioned in the literature anywhere, so I gave it a shot myself. And surprisingly, it doesn't work. Um, it does not appear to be reversible. Something changes very slightly, but you can't go all the way back to pale yellow. So this maybe I mean, it's interesting, it would be interesting either way, but I think this does sort of reinforce the idea that there's an energy gradient that's downhill. And so the colored light basically steers this process downhill in a certain way. 
but it's really going downhill in terms of this you know, potential gradient or whatever. And going back up doesn't work, at least not that I can see. I really wanted this reversibility thing to work, and so I left these solutions irradiating under the 405 nanometer light for days, almost a week actually in this case. So this was the 505 nanometer light uh, fresh, and this was the 505, and then irradiated with the 405 afterwards to try to bring it back to this pale yellow color. So as you can see, something happened. I mean, they're not the same, and we'll look at them under the spectrometer, but it definitely didn't get all the way back to pale. Uh, same story with the 470. So this was the 470 alone, and then this was the 470 followed by 405 to try to bring it back to the pale yellow color. And it did lighten. It was, I seemed like it was getting started. I, was, I saw the lightning and figured, oh, good, we're on our way. But it never, it seemed to level off or something. So I don't know, potentially what happened is that maybe there was some undifferentiated blobs left and it converted those to yellow or something. I, I'm not really sure, but I, I think my idea of having this energy gradient makes the most sense. So it's possible that we could change that by uh, maybe altering the solutions, pH or adding more um, reducing agent or something else, I, I don't know. Let's talk about looking at these nanoparticles with an electron microscope. I knew that the manufacturer of this vintage instrument specified the resolution to be 10 nanometers, which seems like it would be good enough to see the triangular shape of these prisms, which are at their biggest form, maybe about 100 nanometers on a side. But don't think of this as like 10 nanometer pixels or anything. 10 nanometer resolution means that you can tell two larger objects are separated by 10 nanometers. And it doesn't mean the picture's gonna look good at all. It just means that you can tell that they're separated. But even that is a stretch, I think, of what this instrument really can do. I think they were just being really optimistic with 10 nanometer uh, resolution there. So I spent last weekend, you know, cleaning it and choosing the best apertures and the shortest working distances and playing with the beam spread and the emission current and everything. And I, I've got this thing tuned up and driven about as hard as it can go. And this was the image I came up with. So you can kind of see that the particles are kind of angular. I wouldn't swear that they're triangles, but you can tell there's some structure there. It's, they're not round. Uh, and the background is the tracks on a CD-ROM. So we know this is actually a great way to measure things because we know the exact size of the track width and pit. So those, those, the circular pits are maybe about 600 nanometers in diameter. So you can kind of get a sense of how small these particles are. Another big problem with looking at things with an electron microscope is preparing the sample. Something that is always super glossed over in these academic papers is how much work goes into the sample prep. Like, don't think it's easy to just take a drop of blood and let it dry out and putting it into an electron microscope. You'll see almost nothing. And the problem is that if you're interested in looking at blood cells, they're covered in plasma. So there's all this other stuff that's dissolved in there. And if it dries out, it just makes this big sticky mat and you, you won't see any structure in there whatsoever. Same thing with these nanoparticles. The solution still contains a lot of this PVP and dissolved stuff. So if you take a drop of it out of the bottle and just let it evaporate, which is what I did first, all you really see are just gummy little droplets. There's no structure to them. You can't see any particles in there or anything. So I went on this very long expedition of trying to clean the nanoparticles. I already had some experience with cleaning red blood cells, and so I kind of knew how that process worked, where you flush them with solvents and you exchange them into different solvents, and then you have to either supercritically dry them to maintain their shape or use HMDS or whatever. So I was kind of using that same method of thinking to process these nanoparticles, and seeing as how I searched the literature and found almost no help whatsoever, I was just trying things. The problem is these nanoparticles are so small that you can't filter them like you can with red blood cells. A red blood cell is maybe five or, 10 nano, or five or 10 micrometers in diameter, so you can easily filter them out with a, a standard sort of syringe filter. The problem is these nanoparticles are under 100 nanometers. It would go through almost any filter that I have here. So I started searching around, and one idea that came up was to use a centrifuge. Oh, that's, that's nice. In fact, I even found a handy-dandy document that specifies how powerful of a centrifuge you need to separate a given size particle. This is actually very interesting. The smallest particles, the stock solution of fresh nanoparticles, is so small that the centrifuge that I have is not able to separate them. They stay up in solution. But the biggest nanoprisms that we made in this experiment, 
are very easily separated. It only takes a few minutes to get them to settle out. So it's kind of nice to have confirmation that <laughs> the particles really are as big as, they, as we think they are uh, with this you know, extra step here. So again, I thought I still had to wash them though. I was concerned with all this PVP dissolved and I thought, oh, it's gonna look gummy and all this. So what I would do is centrifuge them and create a little pellet. I actually really liked the look of it. You can see the color in, when it's concentrated in this pellet form, pretty neat. Um, and then I would take out most of the solution and resuspend them and wash, do this a several cycles. So pelletize, take the solution out, exchange it with fresh water, resuspend them. But the problem that I ran into is that resuspending them seems to destroy them. Um, I read some people suggest using an ultrasonic cleaner to help resuspend the particles because they kind of stick together. Well, this looked pretty cool, but unfortunately it destroyed the particles. I am not really sure what was happening there. Maybe when you remove all the PVP and citrate from the solution, uh, there's no longer any stable stuff going on and the particles just get dissolved. Whatever happens, this whole process of pelletizing and washing with fresh water doesn't work. I even used water that was pH adjusted to make sure that wasn't the problem or whatever. So anyway, after spending hours and hours playing around with this, I actually found out something much simpler. You just pelletize it once and then use a tiny, tiny pipette. I ended up using one even smaller than shown here and just put the pellet onto your substrate, piece of silicon wafer or a piece of CD-ROM and let it dry and that's it. And so the trick is uh, there's the concentration of nanoparticles is so high that you, you end up not having to worry about gumminess or whatever. And that's how I was able to make these images. All right, let's do some spectroscopy and call it a day. I've got the cuvette here uh, just filled with deionized water and we'll put it in the holder and you can see the setup here we've got a tungsten filament light bulb a diffuser uh, a little lens a collimator to look at through the cuvette at the light source and then pipe that into the spectrometer and this is the waveform that we're getting through all of that but what we want to do is calibrate this and call this flat and then only look at the transmission of light through these different solutions here so i will record a waveform and then switch to transmission mode and then strangely, uh, the software it requires the axis to be changed, which we'll do, and then start it running again. So now this is reading off in percent. So 100%, pretty obvious. The reason it gets noisy at the edges here is because there's just not that much light. Remember, this is going all the way from 200 to 1200. So only where we get a decent amount of visible light will we see a signal. So I will um, dump out this cuvette. And let's start with the fresh nanoparticles. So these are, have been kept in the dark since they were made and they have that pale yellow uh, absorption color. So we can see the absorbance is mostly around 400. And in this particular setup, it's transmitting about 10% of the light at 400 nanometers. And it's pretty uh, transparent elsewhere, except for this peak down in the IR at maybe 1050, which is real actually. And if you look through the literature, uh, that is discussed. So now I'm gonna rinse this uh, cuvette out. And now we'll fill it up with the nanoprisms that we grew with the 470 nanometer LED. So interestingly, uh, the black line is what we're currently looking at, and you can see there's a new peak at about 512 nanometers. Now we actually retained the old peak, so perhaps this one wasn't fully transformed. I, I did give it quite a bit of time. I think this was on there for maybe a day. But in any case, it's pretty obvious what happened here. This peak got a little bit lower, meaning it's absorbing less light at 400 nanometers, and it's absorbing a lot more at 513. But now this is interesting. The LED we used on this was 470 nanometer, and yet the peak absorbance, the new peak, is at 513. This pattern is actually repeated across this whole thing, where the, the new absorbance peak gained from this LED exposure does not match the LED, the wavelength that was used to create the peak. I mean, it sounds a little strange, but if we used 470, you would expect the new absorbance peak to be at 470 because that would match the color of the light and this whole thing about growing the edge length and everything. But as it turns out, it's not the case. There's some other weird red shifting thing that causes the wavelength, the absorption wavelength to be even further away than the 
excitation wavelength that you use. And this pattern is true across the whole spectrum, and it gets further and further away. So by the time we're at 617 nanometer light, the solution is absorbing in the infrared. It's not even colored anymore. You can't even really see anything because most of the absorbance is in infrared because it's gone so far. So why does it do that? I don't know. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very interesting question, and uh, this is all fairly recent research. This whole process of using LEDs to grow nanoprisms was only discovered, I think, in the last 10 or 20 years, so it's actually pretty fresh. So let's finally look at the stuff that, was, uh, that we tried to transform back by reversing the process. Very interesting. See, so it was starting to move back. So now the peak is at 478. This turquoise line was 470 nanometer light only. The black line is the 470 nanometer followed by the 405 to try to bring it back to the pale yellow. But interestingly, it didn't move here, but it did actually move this one a little bit. So something was happening. I, I think maybe it's a combination of just not having enough energy in the solution to make big changes. But maybe you can start shifting it back a little bit. But anyway, there's a lot of, I mean, you could go forever. I mean, it's not, you know, unusual to spend a whole career researching nanoparticles. And so packing it into one 15-minute video or whatever this ended up being is uh, it's kind of challenging and fun at the same time. All right. Well, I hope you found that interesting. See you next time. Bye.